that's an old board member. If I could please remind everyone, uh, Brent remind Brent, everyone needs to set their cell phones to stun or mute them or whatever you do so you don't disturb your neighbors. Uh, before I introduce Brent, and, and it's always a pleasure to introduce a friend to speak, I was having dinner with Brent a year or so ago, and when I realized he was an aerospace engineer and built satellites for a living, my kids and I asked him endless questions about how satellites are built, launched, what they do. He patiently answered all of my questions. And at the end, I said, Brent, you need to do this as a Tuesday night talk. And of course, he said, but I'm not an earth scientist. And this isn't about geology. And I said, well, I think that satellites inform and provide data for physicists, biologists, geologists, and chemists. It's a tool that's absolutely essential for doing the science we do today. And I know that all of you, our members and non-members, will be well, well rewarded by being here tonight. Uh, the point is you don't need to be an earth scientist to do one of these talks. And if you have a talk in you that you want to give, we have about three Tuesdays open next year, uh, but a couple lunch spots. But please see John Heberger or myself, and we can help you put a talk together and give you the time to do it. Uh, Brent is a Wyoming native, grew up in Casper, attended high school there, got his bachelor's and master's of science in mechanical engineering from University of Wyoming. His thesis, Nonlinear Viscoelasticity of Composite Materials, launched his career. This is what the talk will be about. Uh, <laughs> launched his career in the field of advanced materials and reinforced structures. After graduating from the university, Brent worked in the space and communications division of Hughes Aircraft. He there, while there, he taught composite material design to aerospace engineers. He then moved to San Diego where he worked in stealth technology for the Phantom Works division of McDonnell Douglas. We can't talk about that, still classified. Uh, not kidding. And uh, then he left to start a company to make shipping containers out of composite materials. Won, won, won awards from the Society of Plastic Engineers. And then moved back to Phantom Works and, and got more awards, which again we can't talk about. Uh, he returned to LA to finish his career at Boeing and retired as the antenna product team leader with over 26 years experience. Brent currently splits his time between Arizona and Jackson. Please uh, help me in welcoming Brent Schaefer. Uh, what you're seeing here is an Atlas V 
launch vehicle on the pad at Vandenberg Air Force Base in Southern California. It's located just north of Santa Barbara. Now, there's two launch sites in the U.S. The more popular, well-known is Cape Canaveral. And then there's this site out in California. We launch basically military payloads and payloads for the government. Uh, probably they're launching this satellite because of the location into a polar or sun synchronous orbit. Uh, now, at the end of this talk, you're going to be able to explain that to your buddy or your spouse that didn't come tonight, believe it or not. So what are we going to be covering? Uh, how to make a satellite in 45 minutes. Uh, <laughs> uh, how do they work? And I know John Watts can ask me this question, how much do they cost? When can I get mine? And why does it only last 15 years? <laughs> and that sounds like something John said. We'll also cover some of the design and uh, considerations and testing processes. Uh, I'll show you some of the launch vehicles. Uh, and we'll also talk about why different orbits are used. When you launch them, where do you put them? And why are they different? And sprinkled throughout the pitch, I'll try to show you examples of how satellites are used in science and geology. So first of all, there's several kinds of satellites. There's Earth observation, astronomical navigation, communication, there's reconnaissance satellites, uh, biosatellites, and tether satellites. And we'll be discussing the first four up there tonight. So how do they work? Well, my job as the antenna lead was to deliver <clears throat> a set of fully uh, tested antennas and feed networks to the spacecraft for final assembly. And the way these work, um, you see one on the ground in, in the uh, high bay, and this is an artist rendering. Uh, normally the satellite uh, would be flipped over, the antennas would be looking at the Earth, not out in outer space, because this is a communication satellite. But this is an artist picture, so bear with me on it. And, it's, and it looks cool in the brochures. <laughs> um, but what happens is you've got a ground station who uh, sends an uplink, or what we call a command to the, this satellite, and it's received to this uh, high gain antenna. And then those signals are reflected back into these feed horns, which are right here, and I've got a close up view of the feed horn right here. So this is microwave energy that's uh, bouncing off that reflector and going into that feed horn. And then it gets separated into different polarizations, and, and it uh, flows down this uh, wide waveguide. And I've got some examples of it up here. Here's a waveguide junction. And it's basically rectangular tubing. And if you can imagine like hooking plumbing up to your house, well, microwaves behave very well in, in this waveguide. And we have joints and flanges, and we bolt them together just like you'd plumb your house. And being a good plumber, you sometimes have sh structures that move, or you can't uh, join those things up exactly. We have flex uh, waveguide right here. This is a piece of copper flex waveguide. I've got it on the table over there. So that energy goes into the satellite. Uh, it eventually gets to the electronics, where it's converted to a digital signal. Uh, the electronics do whatever they're going to do to it, process that signal, and then they send it back out and it gets reconverted back into microwave energy, goes through all that waveguide, comes out this feed horn, and bounces back off there and back to Earth, back to the user. Now, it might be confusing that, hey, how can input energy go into this waveguide and not be coming out at the same time? What does that interfere? And if you think about it for a minute, if I held a pipe up to, your, to you, and I took a flashlight and I beamed my flashlight down to it, you could see my light. Now, if you did the same thing to me, I could see your light. And if we did it at the same time, we could both see each other's light. So you can kind of think about it that way, maybe it makes a little more sense. OK, one other point before I leave this slide is uh, take notice of the shadows on this reflector. This one's in the complete shadow. This one's in complete sunlight. And these reflectors that I had to design and build uh, the temperature of this surface might be 100 degrees Fahrenheit. That one is probably minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So this guy right here has got a 300 degree temperature difference across its face. And that will tend to warp the reflectors. So there's something we have to do to fix that. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. 
So who builds them? Uh, you might say everybody. The Italians, the French, the Chinese, the Canadians, the Germans, the European Space Agency, Japanese, Koreans, of course there's us. Uh, and then with the breakup of Russia, they actually have two space agencies now. And then there's the UK space agency. And oh, by the way, welcome the newest member of the club, uh, the Iranian Space Agency, which I didn't even know existed until I did this paper. So if you want to Google it, you can see they're actually quite active in the, the satellite business. Uh, they're smaller satellites. They're, they're really research satellites. They're just kind of test rounds. So no need to get alarmed. Uh, so when John decides he's going to buy a satellite from us, uh, here's the companies you can call. Uh, Space Systems, these are who make them, uh, Boeing Defense, uh, Lockheed, a Orville ATK, and there's a couple of European companies, Airbus and uh, who else, and then of course Russia uh, builds satellites. Now modern satellites fall into uh, one of four categories based on size and weight. Uh, power goes kind of hand in hand with that, with size and capability. And it should be said, the larger the satellite, uh, the larger the launch vehicle you're going to need to place them in orbit, which means more cost. Uh, so the microsatellites, this is where Iran is right now. A uh, little tiny experimental stuff, 1,000 pounds generating under a kilowatt, uh, all the way up to you know, these large communication satellites. Uh, Intelsat 22 is uh, 13,700 pounds generates 10 kilowatts of power. So it's quite a bit bigger and uh, takes quite a bit more to launch those. Now, if you come to me, John, and say, hey, I'm ready to buy my satellite, I got the money, um, let's sit down and talk. Uh, there isn't a catalog where you can go through and say, okay, I want that one. You're gonna come to us with requirements. This is the kind of mission I wanna do. These are the kind of instruments I need, et cetera. And so we'll usually sit down and we'll sign those contracts, typically for two to four satellites. And new satellite development and delivery time from starting the contract to I'm going to give you your satellite uh, and deliver it to the launch pad is anywhere from two to three years. And the cost, uh, depending on the payload you want, uh, these things can they start at like $50 million and can go up to $300 million and plus depending on what kind of mission you're after. Now, contracts, once you buy the satellite from us, and John and I sign a contract, um, then he's got to go out and pick a launch provider. And I'll show you some of those at the end of there. But that's a completely different contract with completely different companies, and that's another, depends on the size of your satellite, 400 million. Now, if John is smart, he buys another satellite from me, and the second one probably only costs him maybe a hundred million. So they come down pretty fast. Uh, the uh, big part of the cost is in non-recurring engineering and that design phase that's up front. That's uh, pretty expensive. So, what are some of the design considerations? Uh, first, you have to survive launch, which is where you get all the loads. That's what drives your structural uh, requirements, uh, vibration and acoustic. And then once you get out there, uh, there's all the thermal loads that you get. Uh, you get radiation. We're not inside the magnetic field, so we get no protection. We have to take everything that the sun and the, the universe gives us, uh, solar flares, whatnot. Uh, micrometeoroids. Here's a picture of a shuttle wing with a hole through it. Now, when John signs a contract with me, I'll, I'll probably have an obligation to stop a certain size meteorites, little tiny pellets, but anything this big, no, John, we're not going to sign up for that because the protection would be just be way too heavy. Uh, some of the other, this is a cool thing uh, that you may have known or might not have known, is tin. If you take pure tin, and launch it into space, in the hard vacuum of space, a, a little cube of it, it will start growing these really cool crystals. <laughs> Just towers of crystals. It would be art. And when we plated uh, some circuit boards with that, guess what happened? Uh, the pure tin, uh, there was a conformal coating over these. Uh, anyway, that wasn't there. And in fact, in 1998, uh, the Galaxy 4 uh, telecommunication satellite was disabled due to these short circuits caused by tin whiskers. 
so it took the whole satellite down. Um, initially, we thought that space weather was the cause of the failure, uh, but it was later, no, but it was later discovered that this conformal coating that was supposed to be there wasn't in certain places, and the pure tin started to do its thing in this misplated or miscoded area, and it caused a failure in the main computer. So Hughes now blowing satellite systems. Uh, we use nickel plating rather than tin to reduce the risk of that whisker growth, but we paid a price for it. We were adding now 100 to 200 pounds to some of those bigger satellites just by switching them out. So it's an incredible price. It's more incredible price. If I have a satellite down, John's not going to come back to me, especially at 300 million a copy, and you're not going to be in business long. So, uh, some of the other considerations: grounding. Uh, if you have isolated metal, it will charge up in space, and it will discharge into your satellite, and that can take you out. So everything, but everything is grounded. Venting. If you think about it, you're sitting on a pad, you're at sea level, and then you go up into space, a hard vacuum, in a matter of minutes. So all that air is coming out of every place in your spacecraft. And so you have to drill vent holes pretty much everywhere you can. You cannot trap air. And in fact, uh, there's some samples on the cable that I've taken a picture of. And if you look real close to that honeycomb, there's pinholes in there. And that's because those little cells with the face sheets bonded on them can pressurize and blow the face sheets right off when you get to space. So this might be a solar panel substrate, and if the face sheet blows off, maybe my solar cells come off and I don't have a satellite anymore. So another important consideration. So there's three unwritten rules. You can't bring it back. It's up there. Mission failure is not an option, and also missing a launch date is not an option. Because John has gone out and signed a contract with another company for several hundred million dollars, they've got a launch slot for him. And if he has two satellites, he may have had to, have to work with two different launch providers. So uh, when we say we're going to deliver a satellite to you in two years, we, we will deliver it in two years. Not like building a house. <laughs> <laughs> So how do we make sure that all these satellites work when they get up there? Uh, I'll say we do 100% component testing, and that's what makes satellites so expensive. They're custom. Uh, everything's tested again and again, and tested six ways to Sunday from vibration. We have electrical burn-in. Uh, we thermal cycle everything. Here's some structural tests. Here's a little uh, thruster this guy's setting up for a test. And of course, uh, deployment of solar panels and electrical tests that go on there. And in fact, every component is tested either by its original manufacturer, or in this case by Boeing, to a specific set of predetermined performance and environmental specs. And uh, typically, the customer, like John, is free to witness uh, uh, these tests. And most, most of them do. In fact, it's typical for a satellite customer to place anywhere from 2 to 20 on-site personnel during the build of the satellite program to monitor that test because they want to see what's going on for themselves and we're very transparent with our tests. Now, when I got to this point and I was setting up antennas in these test range, there was light at the end of the tunnel for me because it's about delivery time. Now, these antennas, we, we would probably take on this particular suite, this is not mine, but this might take a week to set this up because we have alignment engineers setting this up to within mills of where it should be. So we're shooting those in with the other lights and lasers and all kinds of stuff. And they get these, uh, these uh, antennas set up just the way they would be on the spacecraft. And we, we so we set this up and we measure uh, antenna patterns and gain once we get these set up. Uh, this is called an antenna suite, by the way, and, uh, and it's, it's identical, again, to what's going on on the ground. And the way this test is run is if you're the audience, I might have a scanner on that back wall, and I'm, I'm looking back there, so I'll put a quarter watt of power through these things, and I'll, I'll scan the patterns, I'll convert it to far field, and then I'll see if it meets my specification. Now, the dots that you see 
on these ABS-2 reflectors are temporarily affixed to the front of each reflector. And the dot positions are called targets. And we measure those targets during the thermal cycle testing. But that test is performed in another facility. It's not here. Uh, the reason the dots are on here is they probably didn't have time to take them off and they were in a hurry to get two tests and wanted to do this. But that's, that's done in another facility. And that thermal cycling is done on a reflector uh, to predict the antenna performance during the normal dance space. Remember those shadows I showed you earlier and the warping that goes on? We want to know what that does and how that particular reflector will test every one of these reflectors individually. And we'll be able to extrapolate and, and know what that's gonna, how that's going to perform uh, under those uh, conditions. Um, to make sure to mitigate that problem, we make the reflector dishes from a low, low, low coefficient of expansion, graphite epoxy. And we even make them on graphite tools to try and uh, minimize those thermal distortion effects. Now, also you might note uh, some of the irregular surfaces on these reflectors, like here, here, here. It looks, looks kind of funky, it's, 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 it's real. Those uh, intentional ripples are actually native to the reflector surface, and they help to produce a very efficient antenna pattern, which wastes little energy. In fact, uh, Direct TV 10, 11, and 12, if you look at their antenna patterns, uh, they look exactly like a map of the US. You wouldn't know any different. Uh, here's another way that they'll, they'll mitigate some of these thermal distortions as you blanket the reflector. Uh, the RF design guys don't like that because it knocks the performance down, but then it's a balance between performance throughout the day with this eclipsing and the distortion versus blanketing. So that's determined on a kind of a case-by-case -case basis. It's sort of mission dependent. Um, of the three, um, so, so the next um, part of the, the uh, so antenna pattern test. Uh, there's three uh, key tests that uh, a spacecraft will undergo just before it leaves. So I've done all the component testing, I've done all my antenna testing, I bring these to the spacecraft and I assemble it. Um, and we, we call this final vibration testing. This is one of the key three tests at the very end, just before we deliver. And uh, this final vibration test is performed at the spacecraft level in all three axes to make sure it's ready for launch. And that vibration environment's going to simulate the experience by launch. And depending on the launch vehicles that John decided to go with, uh, usually we design for two or three. We have to because they, they need flexibility to go to different customers. Well, those will all be kind of enveloped into one test plan. And then uh, we'll try to test each uh, satellite under those conditions. In fact, as Here's a little video I'm going to show you that shows something. These two satellites have accomplished quite a bit and they haven't even left Boeing's factory yet. It felt like I could finally smile and let out the butterflies that I've been holding for at least the last couple weeks. She isn't alone. Many engineers were nervous because they were witnessing history as two 702 small platform satellites were stacked on top of each other. The conjoined pair of satellites will be launched at the same time, putting two satellites in space for the cost of one launch. A first for all electric satellites of this size and class. And we did the development starting back in early 2011, and to be here today, and that, to by the way, that's kind of the getting low to just try and launch the with one. And the stacking we'll was just the beginning. So here's a Z axis vibration test. You can see they're plunging that thing up and down, and they'll swing frequency to make sure that you can stand the real change in amplitude. It'll kind of get faster and faster. It's very exciting to see all the appendages, displacements between the upper vehicle and the higher frequency range. Just get a feeling for the nature of the motion. And then we'll come back and we'll look back in the other direction. The 702 SPs are made of all composite materials and have an all-electric propulsion system instead of a liquid propulsion system, reducing their weight by 4,000 pounds. And that's because when you're up here, believe it or not, it's a pretty Plus hard for the first time, Boeing will launch satellites aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. It's kind of rare that you have a new on a new launch vehicle. It's not that great. At a new launch site. So this is kind of exciting for us.
All that coupled with the dual launch capability, and it adds up to a lot of firsts for one program. Afterwards, we're going to separate the two, so it's the first time separating. So the here's two. how you blow them apart. Sure that successfully and notice this thing real quick. All those things are ready. ready, and the whole product line is new for us, so uh, it's been a learning experience. And for the engineers who designed, stacked, and watched them shake, a successful one. To see it all go together and actually work right the first time um, was a really good feeling. So that, that separation ring, those are basically big clamps held together like a 3 8 diameter bolt or even larger. And there's a pyro device that's on the outside of that. And there's two knives that they'll, they'll fire into those. And it's, there's two because we always want redundancy to make sure that bolt gets cut. Once it gets cut, then it releases all that energy and these things can separate. And that's a similar process of how we separate from the, uh, I'll say, second stage uh, before it gets sawed to orbit. Um, the second large test that is done before delivery is what's called an acoustic test. Now, these are pictures of acoustic test chambers, and the walls of these chambers are three foot thick concrete. And testing is observed with cameras uh, and through viewing windows. And this test is really a, a sonic fatigue test, which essentially extends the frequency of the test you just ran up into the higher ranges because the rockets have that spectrum. Now, all of the antennas that I would build have, would have to get, undergo an acoustic test prior to even being mounted on the spacecraft. And then the entire spacecraft gets put through the same test to make sure it's ready for launch. And on one program that I was working on, we put some test pieces in, uh, not the reflector that was going to fly. And I had technicians that tack bonded some stuff on, forgot to inject it, and finished the bond. And we put them in the acoustic chamber. And when I went in there, those parts were on the floor. <laughs> but it's a pretty tough environment. And you, you wouldn't ever want to put a person in there. You would, you would probably kill them. Uh, the last test is a thermal vac test. And this is where uh, we put the entire spacecraft under, here's, here's the sun, the lamps will come on and simulate the sun, and these doors will close, and the spacecraft will get, uh, this will be pumped down. So, uh, but before this, uh, all electronic components would get individually tested. Uh, my reflectors would undergo that thermal cycle test that I referred to earlier, then they get mounted to the spacecraft, and then to give you a feel of the size of some of these chambers, it's huge. <clears throat> and that thermal vac test is going to be performed uh, to make sure it's uh, ready for launch. And that, that environment, or that test spec, will simulate the space environment. Now, once uh, all that ground testing is completed, uh, the senior scientists, from both the customer and the manufacturer, and the executives from both sides, they, they meet. And then once they decide everything's ready and the checklists are complete, they'll give a consent to ship. When we get that, then uh, the spacecraft will be shipped to whatever launch pad they want. Uh, it'll be reassembled, installed onto the booster. And, and then a final meeting is held by all parties. And a consent to launch is given before we can go forward. And here's a box, a uh, shipping container. This is a NILSAT 22 satellite. Uh, that's one that I work on. This is a payload for the Australian Defense. That's uh, UHF uh, communications for them. Uh, and they're, this is actually a commercial satellite, and they're leasing that uh, capability. So I said, uh, upon arriving, uh, they made it to the booster, and the fairing is installed, and then it's moved through a launch vehicle, or the launch vehicle is moved to the pad. And there's a shot of it in one of these launch vehicles. So if you ever see these pictures, what you want to do is look at these decals. It tells you kind of what's inside there. So if I look at this fairing, which is not the same as this, <clears throat> well, I know it's an American satellite. I know the US Air Force is involved. It's an Atlas launch vehicle. And when I look up here, I see NRO, which tells me that that's a spy satellite in there, <laughs> which tells me that's probably a man of Earth. So, when it's on the pad, and just prior, before 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, go, uh, we actually power up the satellite at that point, and we'll start talking to it. We're testing it, we're checking the comm, we're checking the communications, I say comm, uh, we're making sure it's healthy. 
And that's a different set of antennas than I showed you earlier. These are telemetry and command antennas. They're a little more omnidirectional. So, and, and by the way, uh, and during that period, we, we keep pinging it. We keep making sure it's held. So when, when it's launched, and uh, the first stage uh, separates, and then this, there's a second stage that takes it up further. You blow the launch fairings. Well, the second stage will take you up to orbit, uh, or very near your orbit, and then you'll blow the, uh, the, that ring that you saw earlier. There's a similar separation that occurs. And then the satellite will take over and position itself into its final orbit. Uh, once it does that, then it starts deploying uh, different things like the, the solar panels will de be deployed because you want power first. And those will be tied down with launch locks similar to what you just saw. So they'll be blowing bolts there and, and furling solar panels. The same thing with the antennas. They're launch lock now, probably two or three launch lock per reflector. And then we'll blow those, deploy the reflector, blow some more, deploy another reflector down, and so forth until it's fully deployed. And once that's done, we begin a phase called uh, initial on-orbit testing, or IOT. And that lasts usually about a month, where we're checking out all the systems. It's up there. We're, 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 we're pretending we're a customer. We're trying to put it through its paces. And when we're happy with that, then we turn it over to the customer. So back to the launch. Uh, here's some of the commercial launches that are US. I love this one. We'll steal technology from the geologists, no problem. Uh, in fact, is uh, the way this ran, they would they would set up these rockets in Long Beach, and then they would tow this oil platform down to the equator. And there's a huge advantage to that when you have geostationary satellites, your lift capabilities are dramatically increased uh, the closer you get to the equator. In other words, you have to have less power to get the same payload up. Or conversely, for this pay this rocket, you can put quite a big payload. In. Uh, now this platform was operational from 99 to 2014 in the uh, satellites. Here's the Atlas and some of the Atlas family and some other rockets in there. Um, just to give you a feel for size, here's uh, the shuttle. Uh, it had a capability of like 60,000 pounds to, to lower the orbit. It was a pickup truck and that was great. Uh, these are down in the order of you know, 29,000 pounds. This is on the order of 20,000 pounds. So that shuttle was quite a vehicle for it. Uh, here's the Delta family. Uh, and here's what I was showing you, telling you about earlier. Here's a satellite trying to launch two satellites in one. That's a huge fairing. Uh, here's a, a, a smaller Delta. And they can take these on or off depending on your payload. And then here's the heavy lift one. That's huge. In fact, that's been selected for the Orion program which is our mission to Mars, it's that guy right there. Uh, SpaceX, that's the newest uh, kid on the block, and they're doing actually quite well with Falcon 9. They've had many successful launches, and they're, they're actually bringing that rocket back <laughs> and landing it on a barge in the ocean. If you haven't seen the videos, it's quite impressive. So it's not just, you know, throw it away, you know, get rid of it, build another one. They're actually retrieving them and then refurbing them. And you can see they have plans to go heavier and bigger. And there's a picture of Saturn V, which happens to be our best and heaviest lift uh, uh, in our inventory right now. And that was what made in the 60s. Uh, here's the French launcher. It's Ariane. They have a family of launch vehicles that they use. Uh, they launch out of French Guiana. And uh, last but not least is the Russians. These guys have big rockets, <laughs> and, they, and they put it up for cheap. So they've been actually garnering quite a bit of the U.S. commercial launch business uh, on these proton embryos. In fact, is this, this boy can put one uh, 50,000 pounds up to Leo, almost what the shell could. So I keep talking about Leo and these orbits. So where are these satellites launched to? Uh, there's basically three main orbit classes defined by the satellite's altitude. And uh, this slide illustrates the scale between uh, orbits of LEO, MEO, and HEO. So if I take the Earth and I put it on one side of my slide and the Moon on the other, 
and if I drop bot bands, there's low Earth orbit, there's medium, and this is high Earth orbit. And if I blow it up, here's what it looks like. So high Earth orbit is defined as anything from 22,000 miles up all the way up to the moon megahertz. And at this particular location, 22,240 miles, the orbit is exactly 24 hours, and that's going to be very useful. I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, <laughs> Low Earth orbit, uh, you know, 200 to 1,200 miles. And medium Earth orbit, that's kind of this green zone. That's, that's really where the GPS satellites live. So that's 12 hour period right there. So just to recap, 24 hour period up here, 12, about 90 minutes for your orbit. So low Earth orbit, uh, orbital period I mentioned of 90 minutes. Uh, there's a couple of orbits that I want to talk about, um, but before I do, just to give you a feel for comparison, uh, the altitude record set by a jet in 77 was 123,000 feet. It was pretty high. I don't know if I could breathe after that. Um, and, the, and that's about 23.4 miles. Uh, International Space Station flies at 211 miles. Uh, Hubble was up at 242 miles. And these sun synchronous orbits, uh, these range anywhere from uh, about 400 to 500 miles. It's kind of a narrow band. And the polar guys, the polar orbits, fly anywhere from 700 to 1,100 miles above the Earth. They're inside that period. Now I mentioned polar orbits and sun synchronous orbits. What are those? Uh, and it's essentially what the name implies. A uh, polar orbit is a satellite that orbits the Earth poles. And if you look at this, and if I just orbit in the same spot, guess what? The Earth turns for me. And I can map it. So uh, it's, it's very beneficial for mapping. Now, uh, I mentioned uh, sun synchronous orbit. And that's really just a special case of the polar orbit. It actually orbits around the poles, but closer to the Earth. And uh, to help you understand this, uh, I've got my polar orbit going here in, in the teal lines. And over here, I've got the teal lines going here. So if I set up my polar orbit, as the Earth revolves around the sun, it's going to remain fixed, OK? Same way all the time. Now the sun synchronous orbits, or sun synchronous satellites, uh, they appear over the Earth at the same local solar time every day. And the way you pull that trick off is you want the orientation of that orbit relative to the sun the same, whether it's summer, winter, you see that. How this angle relative to the sun is the same as I go here, okay, as I go here. So this angle relative to the sun stays fixed. Now, the way to do that is there is 360 degrees in a circle. It takes us 365 days to go around the sun. So every day they'll index this orbit by about a degree just to keep up with the seasons in the sun. So, who would use that, that orbit? Well, the USGS does. Uh, Landsat 8, which was launched in February 2013, um, is, a, is in sun-synchronous orbit. Um, in fact, is it's the seventh that reached orbit successfully. I think six, the fairing wouldn't separate, so it didn't make orbit. Uh, originally, this program was called the Landsat Data Community Mission, LDCM which was still a collaboration between NASA and the USGS. And I think it was just as recently as 2013 that the USGS took over uh, uh, maintaining the ground system and uh, conducting the uh, ongoing mission operations. So the USGS has control of that satellite. They decide what it's going to do, where they're going to emphasize, what, what sensors they're going to turn on or off. They, they basically maintain that. Now, Landsat 8 images the Earth in that polar sun synchronous orbit every 16 days. Landsat 7 is still up there and broadcasting and giving us good data. So what they've done is they put those in eight day offsets. So virtually every eight days, the USGS has a new map of the Earth. So if you're looking at old data on your map quest, it's not because it isn't there, it's because they're not implementing it.
and I think it's it's obviously more capable than Landsat 7. So there's there's some other instrumentation on there. In fact, is they they have near infrared, uh, short wave infrared on Landsat 8, and thermal infrared spectrums. And before I leave this slide, I should mention that our very own John Willott was involved in the camera selection of Landsat 1, which was launched in 1952. John, how old are you? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It was launched in 1972. <laughs> so you can, you can talk to him after this about the camera selection for Landsat 1. Uh, some other LEO satellites. Uh, this natural color image on the left here was taken July 27, uh, 2016 using a moderate resolution imaging spectrum radiometer on uh, satellite aqua. You can see the clip require here, lava mountain fire, and the red zones indicate active burning areas at that date. Uh, here's Mount St. Helens with flyovers from Mindset 8 and 7 and 8. Uh, if you were at the talk a few weeks back, you recall there was the initial eruption, and then there was this ridgeback that formed inside there uh, later on, at a later date. And if you're flying over this every eight days, you could almost create a video of this thing just rising up. So, good project for a grad student. Hey Brent, the yes. pictures of the fire, did you get those off the internet? And if yes. so, how? Uh, I think that one was on USGS that, day, that same day or something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I can, I can talk about that. So, <coughs> some other satellites uh, that are up there, there's some space-based LIDARs. Uh, I don't think this is active anymore, it ran out of fuel. Uh, this is a lunar reconnaissance orbiter uh, that they're using LIDAR to map the moon with. Um, some other satellites that look at ocean level, salinity, uh, water, fall, uh, clouds, the way the moisture goes around, uh, uh, migrates around the Earth, rain, cloud, soil mapping, there, there's a number of them. Um, here's a series of spacecraft that are being used to study various aspects of climate science in low Earth orbit. Uh, more specifically, greenhouse gases such as water vapor, carbon dioxide, ethane, ozone concentrations, and distributions in the troposphere. And uh, as we get newer satellites, they get much more accurate and with higher precision and resolution. Uh, Aura is kind of a cool one. This one is the one that resolved vertically the concentrations of ozone and mapped it and correlated it with temperatures. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, with CO2 and correlated it with. Medium Earth orbit. Uh, as I said before, these are where the GPS satellites live. Uh, these are launched into what's called a constellation of satellites in this semi-synchronous orbit at 12,500 miles, meaning that they are over the Earth every 12 hours. Uh, and uh, this uh, blue dot rep represents John Gus Gusslander, who's turning on his GPS. And what this diagram is showing him is that he should be able to see at least six satellites at any one time throughout the day. And that's, <coughs> that's just kind of an illustration of how that constellation uh, concept works. Uh, the navigational satellites, you might be surprised to learn that there's other navigational systems out there. Uh, here's a, a temporary GPS location that they've set up in Yellowstone uh, I guess to measure if this area is moving or not. So you can set these temporary locations up and you can monitor them, you can read them, and, and determine if the Earth is moving and how much and which directions. Now, uh, by the way, the Europeans and the Chinese are getting in the game. Uh, there's actually already some of these satellites up, and their whole constellation is supposed to be up and operational by 2020. In fact, I, I went to the Garmin website, and if you see GPS and GLONASS capable, uh, that means that you can receive signals from both satellites, which says that you can probably acquire sooner or you've got more satellites visible, so that would be the benefit of, of getting that. What are some other uh, benefits or some other applications? Uh, Nepal, 2015, you may remember this when the were killed on that. Uh, there was a magnitude 7.8 earthquake and a 7.3 earthquake. These are the yellow stars here and here, uh, just west of Kathmandu. Uh, 
I guess the, earth, the earthquake initiated here and it traveled this direction, uh, eastward uh, in the purple. Uh, the blue dots that you see there show a decade of micro earthquakes uh, before the earthquake. The white dots are magnitude 4.0 or higher aftershocks. Pretty active region. Uh, those black triangles uh, indicate uh, pre-earthquake GPS stations and white uh, triangles indicate post-GPS stations. Now, they're not translating this far, they're translating just, uh, you know, a meter or so. And of course, the white arrows show you this convergence of this Indian plate and the Eurasian plate, and, uh, which is estimated at about 18 mil millimeters per year, per year. Now, when they set up this GPS network, they're actually monitoring it, and they measured this physical shift with these fixed GPS reference sites. And different than the one I showed you at Yellowstone, you can probably hit these legs with a baseball bat pretty hard and won't budge. So they're buried in there, they, they're, they're meant to be there. Well, on this particular uh, area, they went back and measured, and, and many of the places where they predicted the Earth to move three meters is what it should do to relieve the stress. Uh, this GPS set only to one and a half meters. There's still a lot of pent up energy in there. So think about it. I'm, I'm measuring this GPS site at one minute, and then later I'm over here. Kind of dramatic, <laughs> right? So observations indicate that this region incompletely ruptured between this historical quake. There was a quake in 1934 that was 8.4, it was right there. And another one in 1505 was estimated to be over 8.6. So if this unruptured region, that blue dash, ruptures in a single quake, it, they predict it could exceed magnitude 8.0. So the conclusion is that that earthquake that happened, those two big ones that happened, was not the big one that expected. OK, high Earth orbit. This is the part where it's 22,240 miles out. Now, in these fixed positions, they offer ideal viewing for communications, television, and weather satellites. Uh, because they orbit Earth once per day, when you put them up above you, they're going to be there all the time. Uh, and because of that, there's a limited number of slots. And because of that, they, that makes them very desirable. So it's probably one of the most highly sought after in the commercial world. Uh, now you may hear the term geostationary or geosynchronous. They're not the same. The geosynchronous orbits are slightly inclined and they're not used a whole lot. Uh, the geostationary ones, the ones that are above the equator, are the ones that are of interest. Now, I should mention that you can modify a satellite's orbit a little bit, like we did with the sun synchronous example, but you can't take a LEO satellite and move it to HEO and vice versa. It doesn't work that way. You just you burn way too much fuel. So satellites in these orbits must occupy uh, a single ring above the equator, and they're home to numerous satellites, which have to be uh, spaced in order to avoid uh, frequency interference with one another, <coughs> which has uh, actually caused issues. Uh, if you can imagine, there's countries north and, uh, and south of the equator who want that same uh, slot. Now that gets resolved uh, by the International Telecommunications Union. They're the ones that uh, sign the slots and resolve the issues. Uh, the owners can share these slots, but that's only done if the satellite they're going to share with has a different frequency. In fact, is uh, Boeing reworked uh, DirecTV 12 satellite, so this could be accomplished. Excuse me, DirecTV owned two slots, and they put 10 and 11 in each slot, and they had this new satellite that was initially uh, going to put, be put in orbit as an in-orbit spare. So in the event that one went down, they'd have a spare right up there. Well, they decided that it's more business sense if they could just change the frequency, park it there, and put more uh, high-definition channels to your TV set. So that's what they did, and that's what we did. We had to actually change up the antennas. We had to you know, throw the old ones away. The electronics were broadband enough that we could reuse those, but uh, it was a fairly simple change for us. So here's a map of the geo belt, and here's the satellites that occupy each one of those slots. Um, you might draw a couple of conclusions from this map. First, uh, all the key orbital slots are already taken. And two, there are multiple users in certain slots, and you can tell where they are. You know, here's the United States, 
country. Over here is Europe. Over here is Russia. Now here's the middle of the ocean. There's no land out there. Nobody wants that. So that's why I said, let's go, let's go cheap. <laughs> so because of that, most geostationary satellites are kept within a very small operational window. They only let them wander about a half a degree, which at that range is 200 miles. And they uh, keep those in that narrow window by firing those little thrusters that you saw a picture of earlier at the appropriate times to correct any orbit decay or uh, deviations. We call it wobble. And wobble occurs because of several factors. The sun, the moon, the Earth's sun. Around, really, it's uneven. Additionally, there's solar wind and sunlight. And all those uh, cause uh, orbital instability. <coughs> And it requires a little bit of thrust to correct for that. So I have to put it, as the orbit decays, I have to put it back up. And they'll put it back up a little bit beyond so it can kind of decay through so they can more bang for their buck. So you, you have to use fuel to do that. And as a result, satellites run out of fuel. There's a limited number of fuel that they can take. And it's the key reason for all satellites being replaced. Okay. In a modern geosat lifetime, when I got out of school and was working for uh, Hughes then, our geosat lifetime were seven years. And they would give us bonuses if we could make 10. Now, I have to guarantee John Willott that these 14 to 18 years, or he's not gonna buy my satellite, he's gonna go to the other guys. So I wanna keep it as a customer, so I gotta do that. And, and they do make those, those uh, times, by the way. Having said that, uh, they actually hold a reserve back because those slots are so precious. You don't want a bunch of other junk in there. When your satellite gets old, you push it out of the way. So they'll, they'll actually raise it up into a higher orbit, into what's called a geo graveyard. So that slot can be reused. And they do that same thing in low Earth orbit. First, they'll try to deorbit it and let it crash into the Earth and burn up. Uh, or the second, they'll try to uh, they'll raise it up. And get rid of it. just about there. Uh, communication satellites, they're typically stationed in these geosynchronous orbit, and here's some examples. Uh, Telstar up here was one of the first communication satellites. It was developed by Bell Labs and launched in 1962. It weighed a whopping 170 pounds, developed 14 watts of power, had one transponder that was capable of transmitting one television signal, black and white, or several telephone calls you have to pick. You can't have both. Can anyone in this audience remember live via satellite? Yes. Yes. Not very good. Okay. So compare this to Intelsat 22 on the right that was launched in 2012. It's located at 72 degrees east, if you care to look it up on the map. It weighs 13,700 pounds. It develops 10 kilowatts of power, and it operates 90 channels. So the electronics have involved a bit. There's a relay satellite, there's DirecTV 12, there's XM radio satellite, if you just want to see what they look like. Uh, by the way, when we won this contract, uh, we won a contract for two satellites, and we nicknamed them Rock and Roll. <laughs> so if you had parts, you had to know them, did they go to Rock or to go to Roll? Uh, we actually won the follow-on uh, for three and four, and they're rhythm and blues. Okay, astronomical satellites, they're used to study planetary geology or astrogeology. And these fly in polar, uh, sun synchronous, or halo orbits. Uh, they'll operate in many different frequencies from the visible to the x-rays to gamma rays. Uh, SWIFT is kind of a cool one. That one looks for these gamma ray bursts of a neutron star merger. And it's felt that it, it takes that kind of energy to produce heavy elements like gold, lead, and platinum. So this has a what they call a bat burst area telescope to try to spot those events. And then, of course, uh, the replacement for Hubble, James Webb Telescope. Now you notice uh, these guys are what these called halo L1 or L2 orbits. So what's that? Well, if you do the math, the, it tells you, the planetary mechanics tell you there's these points, one, two, three, four, and five, that are stable orbit points. So if I put a satellite here at L1, it will, it will at 92, 932,000 miles away from the Earth, it will orbit the sun the same way the Earth does. So 
deep space that discovers satellite that should do the previous slide, uh, studies solar winds with effects on the Earth. So what better place to park a satellite than out there, right? You're closer to the sun, you can see the events. Uh, at L2, out here, that's where they're going to put the James Webb telescope. Remember, Hubble's in low Earth orbit, so we're going to put James Webb out at L2. And also this uh, wide field infrared survey telescope, which probably has about 100 times more capable than Hubble. And then there's the SCIA probe, uh, that's the European Space Agency's mission. It's out at L2, and its job is to map the gal uh, Milky Way galaxy in a three dimensional sense. Is the James Webb still in space? As far as I know, yeah. What was, what was the question? Say. Oh, the question was, is the James Webb still on schedule? And as far as I know, I'll show you a picture this side. Uh, it's, uh, so the James Webb uh, is it's to be launched in 2018. It will not replace Hubble, probably uh, uh, augment Hubble with much greater capability with its 21 foot year. And the diagram on the right kind of gives you that comparison between Hubble, Herschel, and JWST mirrors. Now, Herschel is a radio wave telescope, but it's just there for uh, comparison. Uh, the diagram on this down here illustrates the enhanced capability that JWST will provide. And so what I've shown, uh, let's see, Mike Adler will explain redshift to you. I won't. Uh, this is the time after the Big Bang. And so we're sitting on Earth, and we, this is the present. And with uh, ground-based telescopes, well, let me back up a minute. If you think, if, if you look at the sun, I don't look at it directly, but the light generated on the surface of the sun takes eight minutes to reach the Earth. So if the sun were to shut off right now, we wouldn't know it for eight minutes. Okay. So if you think about that, light traveling clear across from the Big Bang is going to take millions of years to get here. And with ground-based telescopes, uh, we can discern events uh, six billion years after the Big Bang versus, what, nine billion with the unaided eye, if you can see something like that. Hubble and enhanced Hubble reduced that to one and a half to and eight billion years, respectively. And the James Webb Telescope will allow us to see uh, events that occurred probably only 200 million years after Big Bang. So it's going to be a huge, huge thing for astronomers. Now, in this particular satellite, it's built up of mirror sections, and these are assembled into one unified mirror. And because of those launch bearing limitations that I showed you earlier, and it's got a fit in that bearing area, these three are deployed back. These three will probably do the same. Uh, so they'll be stowed, launched, and the bearing will be blown, and these, these mirrors will be put back into their final uh, positions when it achieves orbit. Uh, here's a cool one I had to include. Uh, cover. We're, we're just about out of time, so I'll go quick. Uh, New Horizons. This was a Pluto flyby. Actually, it's uh, meant to be a study of the Kuiper Belt. And the Kuiper Belt is a region that's made up of various objects left over from the formation of our solar system. And Pluto's actually part of that Kuiper Belt. So it was launched in 2006 and traveled at 30,000 miles an hour. It reached the moon in nine hours. Uh, it took nine years to get to Pluto. So it got there uh, in July of 2015. And in January 2016, NASA releases images of an ice volcano, which kind of shocked the community because it was thought to be just a big frozen rock and geologically dead. So this is kind of exciting new news. And a little bit later, images were returned of an ice mountain range that's equivalent in size to the Rocky Mountains. So it's not really geologically dead. Uh, it's believed, it, actually it's believed that there's uh, quite a lot of water on Pluto and it's being warmed by this volcanic activity. Now, the Rocky Mountains, keep in mind that Pluto is smaller than our moon, so that's quite a big feature on that little planet. So in summary, uh, satellites run out of fuel, which limits their lifetime. Orbits are mission specific, depending on what I do. Uh, satellites can weigh 14,000 pounds and range in price from 350 to 300 million plus your launch costs, and they're used quite a bit. Are there any questions? <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, the question was, what fuels them besides the solar panels and why would that run out? Uh, first of all, the solar panels are only providing power for the electronics so I can transmit and relay the signals. Uh, there are propulsion tanks, usually on a satellite, and those draw from those propulsion tanks. Uh, some of the newer satellites use ion propulsion and they call them electric, so they're trying to get past that part of running out of fuel. But in the event, anyway, uh, if you have a 15-year-old satellite, uh, do you have a 15-year-old computer? You probably did, right? <laughs> 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 I, I tease. I'm not kidding. <laughs> so, so you probably want to replace it anyway. Um, the next one, you have Given the variables on geosynchronous communication satellite, broken slots, frequency, positional accuracy, uh, how full are the slots? I mean, are we at 80% capacity of satellite capacity? Uh, the question was how full are the slots? And I would say the slots are full. Uh, the only way you're going to wedge into there is if you design a satellite or your satellite system has uh, a different frequency that you're going to fit into, or it's like buying a house. You're going to wait till that guy moves out so you can move in. Uh, or, they're that full. Or modulation technique, you can get more data. Right. And so you've got to go so, negotiate with that owner of that slot and say, hey, I can park next to you, really. And this is why I can do it. So, anyway, Elizabeth. Um, I have two Apple. The question was, uh, my phone is was real accurate last summer, now it's not, or something. It's can you look up to more than one on American satellites? They can also look up to Russian satellites. Uh, not to my knowledge. Uh, you'd have to ask Apple. Why, are they? Yeah. Is it going to ask Apple? I didn't know that. The second ring is not showing up now. I tried to catch the second ring last week. Well, maybe we'll look at that a little later. Okay. Yes. When well, the customer takes possession of the satellite on the rocket, and he's contracted with the rocket. Do they have insurance in case the rocket blows up? Yes. <laughs> that, the question was, you know, you, you, you launch, there's big costs on the satellite, there's a rocket that could blow up, the parent could not separate. Uh, is there insurance? Uh, yes, almost all satellites are insured. Uh, some of them buy, you know, their own companies. They'll take that risk because the insurance fee is pretty close to what they, they cost. <laughs> yes. I was wondering, the satellite that was um, doing reconnaissance for the sun, that solar panels on that, can you explain uh, some, some of the specific ways that, that um, it would differ from the panels that were further away from the sun? I, I, in other words, you, wouldn't you need a, specific, uh, a special <coughs> protection? for those panels because it's so close to the sun? Uh, okay, so I think I, if, if I understand your question, uh, you're asking about those halo orbits. When you get a lot closer to the sun, is there more protection that I need to consider for those solar panels versus the ones that are close to Earth? And I would say the answer is probably no. Uh, what's happening out at 22,000 miles, again, because we're not under the protection of the Earth's magnetic field, we're, we're taking everything out there. And in fact, if we know about a solar event or a, a high uh, period of activity, sometimes it'll actually shut satellites down, whether the storm can turn them back on in certain cases, if they can do that. Now, communication satellite, if they shut off direct TV, you're going to be calling right away. <laughs> so they wouldn't do that. They'd just go out there and take it. So no, I, I don't believe so, but I don't, I don't know that for sure. Yes? So if Pluto is more than a ball of ice, can it be elevated to a planet's status? <laughs> <laughs> so, so the question was, <laughs> it was more than a bomb of ice going to be elevated to a planet because it's geologically active. Uh, remember when Pluto was first discovered, it was the planet, and we thought it was a planet. Well, then they kind of uncovered this Kuiper belt, and maybe Mike can talk about that more. They said Pluto is just another big rock. It's one of the biggest rocks in the Kuiper belt. So it's really not a planet. It's part of that Kuiper belt. There so that's many, the discussion. There are many objects that are that big or even bigger. Even bigger. 
So are they planets? You, I guess you have to decide. But this one kind of has a nice orbit, and it's got geod geology on it now. <coughs> and by the way, that New Horizons is flying into the Kuiper Belt, so that they're probably going to be investigating more of those uh, big bodies. Oh, yes, that's a whole talk in itself. The question was, the lots of the moons have geology. Yes. Is there anything that uh, would be a threat to the whole satellite system or individual satellites or what? Well, both the U.S. the Chinese have launched anti-satellite uh, weapons, and they've actually blown up targets in space. In fact, is the Chinese did that in 2007 and created about a million pieces of debris up there, from golf ball size to you know the size of your head to you know everything else, and. I think NORAD has to track them if they're like a centimeter or bigger, so <laughs> work a little bit way up. <laughs> Good thing for your computer. Does that only affect one little? Uh, so, so that, uh, let me finish the answer to your question. So you, you, are the satellites threatened? Uh, well, you know, it's kind of one of those unwritten rules that you should have my satellites, I'll shoot down yours. And, you know, everybody is dependent on those satellites, so you'd kind of be shooting yourself in the foot a little bit because, you know, maybe you don't have a GPS to that takes GLONASS for the new ones. And you need that American system to find out where you're at. So. Um, and, and yeah, so, and, and I think, uh, I can't get into that, never mind. No. <laughs> <laughs> it looked like that L2 space would allow you to get into the shadow of the Earth from the sun. Is there, would there be uh, not at a million miles, but, but, you know, I don't know, you'd have to do the diameter study, but at a million, or 932,000 miles away, that Earth's going to be kind of a dot. There. So it, 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 you know, will it totally eclipse the satellite? Uh, no. Randy, you talked about uh, over here. You, you talked about uh, space junk or the, or the Chinese uh, are shooting down satellites. What about very strong EM pulses from the sun? What do you do to protect a satellite from extremely strong? So the first thing you do is you ground everything. And I mean everything, from graphite tubes to aluminum fittings, you don't assume that bond is good, you ground everything. Uh, the second is, we have to harden a lot of those electronics to a certain degree, and then we put them down inside the spacecraft. So uh, we do have some layers of protection, and depending on the specification, they will actually harden some of those boxes to a, to a certain level. I mean, at, if you get a catastrophic event, uh, it, it, the sun has taken out satellites before. Just, they, they're working now and now they're not. So. Is that failure mode EM mode or is it a charged particle? Problem? The question was, is it EM mode or charged particle? Uh, you said EM. Well, he's just saying a pulse. He's, he, I think what he means is there's a lot of energy from the sun can that, that take you out. So I'm trying to address all those frequencies. Any other questions? Not, well, I, I would just comment, I didn't come here tonight thinking I was going to buy a satellite. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anybody want to uh, join me in this? And uh, what kind of satellite would you like to buy? <laughs> I, I did, he, uh, he did allude to when I was in graduate school in 1978, uh, I was actually working with uh, a geographer who we were literally designing filters on what was called Hertz back then. Earth Resource Satellite before they put it up in 72. One of the things that really struck me is I asked the professor who worked on a whole lot of other stuff, those satellites he can't talk about, and I said, well, how good are they? This is back in 1970. How good do you think the spy satellites are? What can they see on Earth? Anybody? 70? 71. A meter. A meter. Okay. Anybody else? Are we about today satellites or? No. 1970. This is the answer I got in 1970. Yeah, that'd be pretty license plate. License plate. Anybody else? Go for the car. paper headlines. <laughs> the uh, answer I got is on a good day. They can see the headlines on the newspaper in Moscow. Jesus. Think what they're doing today. <laughs> Cover up in your backyard. <laughs> no, it was satellite. This was 
And I don't know whether it was the film drop satellites or just what back then, but Mike, sir. Uh, no, thank you, John. Uh, so tonight we do not have to move the chairs. They can oh. stay right where they are. <laughs> Brent will be here for a few minutes to answer questions and show you some of the material that he brought, which is some very